So welcome to the live for today. Um, so I'm happy to welcome here Hans Eisel from Biodiversity of Berlin. We will be talking about planning this patient, new perspective for the state of planning. Yes, thanks so much. Thanks for the kind invitation and thanks to the organizers for all the effort and pain and sweat for, for setting up this very nice um, um, workshop. So indeed, within the next 40 minutes or so, we shall be concerned with the topic of timing dissipation. When we have a look at a, some a small and possibly uh, fun and possibly a bit crazy little um, cute idea um, that could add a fresh flavor in a way to the field of dissipative quantum information processing. I should say that this is joint work with Michael Castellano, the postdoc who just um, joined my group a couple of weeks ago, and it should also become clear in a minute what this somewhat mysteriously looking picture of the car pack can be all about. In fact, that's the entire point of, of this talk. Okay, let's see. Um, so a lot of the point of... Uh, does anybody have a proper work, probably work with remote control? Remote control? Yeah. So a lot of the... Let's check the words on that. Okay. <laughs> Eternal problem. Oh my god. Never mind, it's fine, I'm fine. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so a lot of the point of um, quantum information processing is to be able to coherently manipulate the quantum state of a collection of um, quantum systems. So one thinks of having some sort of coherent control that one is able, say, to sequentially apply a number of um, a quantum gates in the circuit model of quantum computing. Now, as we all know, of course, this is always some degree of um, abstraction. Any real quantum system is to some extent always coupled to an environment that will undergo quantum noise and uh, dissipation, and uh, it will, some information will leak out to um, the environment in one way or the other. The typical jargon is that this quantum noise is detrimental to its evil and bad and detrimental to quantum information processing because some of the logical quantum information is leaking out in the environment the system is coupled to, and that's of course the entire point of the field of quantum error correction to make use of sophisticated encoding such that the state of the system is of course changed because of that, but that as little as possible of the logical quantum information is leaking in a way to the environment. Okay, very good. So usually, and in particular if the coupling is very weak, which we um, shall assume, um, the quantum noise is, to a good approximation, Markovian. Actually, to a very good, extraordinarily good approximation. So in many quantum optical settings, people are not even aware that they're making an approximation when they treat the noise in a, in a Markovian fashion, so in a lossless fashion um, in, in this form. The formula means that you have a dynamical semi-group that reflects this Markovian lossless dynamics of the system interacting with the environment that's um, generated by a Neuvillian, and that's the right-hand side of a master equation, and not every um, Neuvillian is a valid um, Neuvillian that if you integrate it up gives rise to a valid complete map by Ian. Um, but there's a specific most general form of that pi, this is a called Lindblad form, and this thing we've just seen in the previous talk by Marcus, um, these are the Lindblad operators, and um, well, this form is not unique, but still one can to a large extent identify these individual Lindblad operators with physical processes that are going on, so one can interpret these like with uh, like photon losses or so, like as nice individual quantum processes um, that are happening. Actually, the converse problem is a fun computer science problem that we've just looked at, the, the, the quantum embedding problem, which is like given a, a channel, given a completely positive map, can you write it as e to the power of LT, where L is a, um, is a Levillian such that e to the power of TL is 
completely positive, uh, is completely positive for our time. So can this have a reason for my Markovian process? And that's an old problem, like 70 years old, and actually identical to the problem whether to, to prove whether P is NP. So that's a bit of a fun um, implication. <coughs> so if you go to the matrix form, so I didn't think of quantum states as elements of a vector space, you just have big vectors, and then the whole mass equation is applying a big matrix to big vector, which is the density operator, and then the, the really takes this matrix form, and there's this gap here, which is the smallest non-zero real part of the eigenvalues of this operator, which to a large extent governs the speed at which things are happening in, in, in the system, as we will see in, 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 in this. Okay, now usually, and that's also the common paradigm of quantum error correction, not, the quantum noise is not seeing the entire system in one shot, but systems usually undergo local quantum noise. Like each individual, individual system sees its own environment or so, or maybe a couple of systems see a, a joint environment, but there's some sort of locality involved in, in, the, in, in the system. So formally means, this means that one has k local quantum noise, which means that the Lewillian is, can be written as a sum of terms, each of which has the support over k sites, where k is not 10,000 or, or large, but like 1, 2, 3, single site noise or correlated noise to errors. That's a um, common um, situation. So systems see their local environments, and that's, I mean, it's really hard to get around that. That's a very common situation that you encounter in natural open quantum systems, specifically in the quantum optical context. So it's like that. Your noise that um, the ion trappers in this group are fighting is this, that type of local noise that you encounter in one way or the other. Now there's a very familiar theorem on the evolution of that type of systems. That's this um, convergence theorem, which means that if you have a quantum system undergoing quantum noise, so we have a Markovi quantum channel, the Lewillian of which has a gap, lambda. Now, you can pick any number that's as large as the, like almost as large as the gap, such that for any state you can have, there exists a constant such for all times this is true where this is the stationary state. This means that, um, let's assume that the stationary state is unique, that's the deviation of the state as a a function of time from the stationary state, which means that if you have a gap, and that's the right hand side that governs what's going on, it will just move to the stationary state and will stay there forever, and the right hand side governs on what time scale that happens, and that happens independent of the initial state. You start, you go to the stationary state, you start with something else, you go to the stationary state, you can kick it in between, and it will be just driven there and will stay there uh, forever. That's a um, very well-known um, conversion theorem in 101 um, uh, open system dynamics. It's also a classical analog um, thereof. It also quite impressively shows how uh, detrimental a nasty quantum noise can be, because surely, if you want to do coherent quantum information processing in the form of gates, or if you want to do things, you better do this before this a conversion to a stationary state sets in because that's kind of the, the climate there of nothing happening anymore. You have to do it before. That sets the time scale up to which you end up in the stationary state that's um, happening in, in, in one way or the other. There's nothing one can do about that. This is the bad, no uh, the bad news. The good news is that, um, well, one can also draw some benefits out of that. And, um, this, in recent years, it has been realized that uh, the, this common jargon that quantum noise is evil, detrimental, makes things impossible in quantum information processing is surely not wrong, but it's also not entirely correct. And in a certain way, one can also make use of quantum noise. It can be beneficial. One can fa facilitate things by making use of quantum noise if it comes in the right flavor, right doses and um, in the right fashion, but quantum noise can be a good thing. And um, that's the, the point here, so one makes noise and alive. That's the point of dissipation quantum information processing. And the simplest instance of that type is really, it's 
almost obvious, but it's still um, an interesting uh, point to be made, because you have a system, independent of the initial state, will be driven to the stationary state. If this stationary state happens to be a pure state, one of the call it a dark state, but there's many words for the same term, it can be unique, it can be reachable in poly time, it can have all the desirable features, it can be an entangled state, it can have topological order, it can have many fun things, and then, no matter what you do, whoops, it will be driven to this stationary state. So noise doesn't kill it, but it, put, it, it facilitates this very preparation of um, this quantum state. And recent years have seen a number of ideas of that type of dissipative state preparation. One can think of driven quantum phase transitions where um, one has an open system and thinks of notions of quantum criticality and so on but not as ground states of local Hamiltonians, but of stationary states of open systems, but, but these concepts still make sense. But can think of, think of topological order by dissipation, um, like entanglement from white noise and all kinds of, um, of, of um, concepts of the type. And, and indeed, there's been a, a massive wealth of um, uh, results along this line of thought. It's usually a very poor argument to argue that there's many papers on the server of a subject who claim how interesting a subject is. But um, as a defense, it's really a quite smart way of preparing a quantum state because, again, no matter what the initial state is, you're driven to the stationary state, you're protected by the gap, and independent of the ways in the middle of the initial state, the state will be prepared and can be unique. It's, if you can do that, that's the smart way of preparing a quantum state because we're just driven to this stationary state and we'll just stay there forever. There's um, refinement of that idea. Um, one can think even of dissipated quantum computing where one solves BQB problems, but not in the form of sequentially applying quantum gates one after the other, but in the form of just well, preparing whatever, it doesn't matter, you just have an arbitrary state, and then you let the system undergo its own dynamics, its own local quantum noise. I mean, there's no control. It just goes. It's just a kind of de decohering in a certain way. And at the end, you measure one bit. And if you make a position problem, that one bit encodes the problem, the, the outcome of the computation. Yeah? So that's a particularly charming way of thinking of um, quantum computing. One can think of little thermal machines or thinking of cooling by heating. You have a a device you shine very hot light onto that and you can cool the quantum system quite counterintuitively that one would expect. So in this sense, also noise helps. It doesn't make things worse, evil, bad, dirty, um, undesirable, but you can make it possible by making use of dissipation in the right form. This is um, theory stuff, but there's also experimental progress on this. We've just seen in the last talk, nice talk by Marcus, an open systems ion trap simulator at the end of this talk. There was just along this idea of having an open system that you simulate in the lab with ion traps in the stroboscopic fashion, as he um, briefly explained at the end of this talk. <coughs> his, his, his talk. And maybe most of this uh, spirit of this paradigm of um, dissipation driven stuff are these experiments in um, ensembles by Eugene Bolzik's group as. Um, experiments of entanglement generation by dissipation. Again, you just have a dissipative system, you let it go through, and it will end up in an entanglement state that also certified in what sense it takes the So, the time is not broken, and you kill things, and, uh, and so on, you do noise, um, but you create this entanglement state by means of noise. I think I really made the point. Um, what are the desirable features? Well, you're protected by the gap, in the sense that we saw earlier. Um, you are if independent of the initial state, it will be driven there. You don't need to measure things, there's no need to intervene, there's no need to do things, control things, but the system is just driven to the situation that you would want to have. That's a very desirable feature, and this is a nice thing to That's a good piece. On the negative side, uh, well, <laughs> That's also a negative thing. I mean, you cannot so easily measure, but you can, but then you lose the protection of the, of the gap. It's entirely, entirely against the point of, of the spirit of what you have in mind. You cannot so easily interact. 
you cannot so easily do things sequentially. The whole point of a protocol is that you, well, you wake up, you buy milk, you have breakfast, and you do, th do things one after the other. The whole notion of this making sense is that you have to have some sort of time order of doing things. The whole point of a protocol is that you apply gate one, you apply gate two, or channel three, you do things. It doesn't even make sense because, but it's just, you're exponentially quickly driven to the, your, your stationary state, that's nothing you can, you can do about it. Um, you cannot easily condition on outcomes that you do something, and conditioned on that thing, you do something else. <laughs> that's the point of conditioning. Not so easy. Maybe more importantly, quantum error correction is far from clear how to incorporate that. And if this idea of dissipative quantum computing should ever fly, of course one has to have an understanding of dissipative error correction, because it's very nice that you can tune your Lindblandian noise, but of course there's also the, the true evil quantum noise that you don't have under control. And that we don't have to teach experimentalists that this can be a nasty thing and that it should be kept under control. Think of quantum memories, like top passive topologically protected quantum memories. Can one do this? This is a big um, open question um, in the end of here. Maybe more from a theory perspective, it would be fun to have like, easier proof techniques, at least as a proof of principle to show <laughs> what can be done and what cannot be done, to then, once it's known what can be done and what cannot be done, to go through it and see how one can tweak things and refine and make more amenable to um, actual experimental improvement. And the point of the rest of the talk, although it's about the progress and a bit um, proof of principle -y, is to give an answer to these questions. Um, to, as, at least to the extent that, as tick the box, they are all satisfied. Then one can see what one does. Um, yeah. I'm doing fine with time. Good. Okay, but let's come to something completely different. Yeah, to playing cards. Um, to the cut-off phenomenon. Um, and let's go to let's go back to this thing that we saw earlier, to this um, convergence uh, theorem. That again says you have a Markovian process, independent of initial state. It will be driven to the stationary state in one norm. That's what you want to have, and that's this right hand side that governs that this happens exponentially quickly in one way or the other. It's a very well known theorem. Uh, it just shows exponentially quickly things are driven to the stationary state, but well, what about this innocent looking R, this so-called prefactor? People like to uh, uh, sweep it out of the car, but it's just the prefactor. Well, prefactors can be important, because in order to have rapid convergence to the stationary state, you don't only want this gap to be, the inverse gap to be polynomial in N to be rapid, that this term becomes small, but you don't want the prefactor to blow up as well. So R should be smaller than that, because if the prefactor blows up at the same time and the gap bar is small, nothing is happening. It's, it's very unclear what, 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 what happens. And indeed, there are processes that have a constant gap, but have an exponential convergence time in the system side. What is more, the pre-asymptotic behavior can be highly non-trivial. So, um, and that's an insight that's relatively recent. Even in classical, classical processes, that's something that people noticed in the 90s, which is funny, right? That, that you can notice things in the 90s on the classical stochastic maps. Never mind. Um, and the funniest uh, non asymptotic behavior that I'm aware of is this cut off phenomenon. If you don't find this remarkable, that could be due to me finding this, uh, not knowing anything more remarkable than that. Um, and the point is, is as follows Think of mixing. Card mixing. Let's assume you have a deck of cards, n cards, say 52, and you mix the cards by, well, there are many ways of mixing cards, right? You shuffle like this, or you can do, this is um, one very normal model of doing this, you make two piles, and then pile A, pile B, with probability A divided by A plus B, you draw from this deck, with probability B divided by A plus B, you draw from this deck, and then do, 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 draw cards from the deck. Gilbert model of card shuffling, never mind, it shuffles the cards, obviously. Also, it's clear what the station, this is a stochastic map, so 
Um, before I was continuous time, quantum, now I'm discrete time classical, so I'm talking about stochastic maps, discrete time processes, but never mind. The stationary state is clear, it's the uniform distribution, the cards are just mixed. Yeah, I mean, that's obvious. But there's something remarkable happening here. Because if you do this card shuffling, it will not really be shuffled. It will not be very mixed. In fact, a lot of the information of the initial distribution will still be in the card deck. In fact, a lot of information of this initial thing will still be in the card deck. You shuffle again, and a lot of information will still be in the card deck. In fact, this is how it looks like. Um, here, this is the, the infinity norm of the deviation from the stationary distribution. It kind of shows how mixed the thing is in the classical world. You mix once, it's one. It's not mixed at all. You mix twice, one. It's not mixed at all. Three, da, 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 da. You mix up to like seven times and then it's suddenly very mixed. That's the kind of phenomenon. Yeah? So that's funny. I mean, of course, as in totally, there's a gap. As in totally, it goes to the uniform distribution. But the pre asymptotic behavior is very non trivial in the sense that it doesn't mix for a long time. And then suddenly, in a very short time, it goes almost to stationarity. And up to an exponentially small correction, it will stay at stationary. That's the cutoff phenomenon. So here, in this, this is mathematical provable that this is well mixed after 3 over 2 log n shuffles and very poorly mixed um, before 3 over log n uh, shuffles. And this is apparently used in this magic trick called Primo where you have this kind of card thing, you give uh, uh, the, the deck to the audience and let the, let the audience pick the card, put it back and you shuffle and let somebody else shuffle and guess again what the card was in the first place. This is well known magician's trick that apparently uses uh, that kind of phenomenon. And um, that was used before, there was a body of, of folk knowledge on this somehow, I mean this is the only time ever I will cite Magician Monk from the 8th, 67th, and 9th of It's a very uncommon citation. Still, they knew it, they did it, but the mathematical reason for this is this kind of phenomenon. This kind of happens when you have a gap model and a very high degeneracy of the first excited state of the There's um, some subtle um, stuff happening. There's also a number of other instances that are not known to show this cover. <coughs> Good. Um, so again, some information about the initial state is preserved until a critical time, and then suddenly, shortly after this critical time, essentially no information about the initial state can be recovered. It's a very non, uh, non trivial, as non asymptotic behavior of um, these processes. Quantumly, you can think of the convergence measure. You ask how far away are you in one norm from the stationary state. And then you can think of a sequence of, of maps, of channels, and you say they exhibit a kind of phenomenon if um, for any C that is constant larger than zero, this, there's a cutoff from, the, if the C is smaller than one, then the limit of large systems goes to one, and this goes to zero. So asymptotically, this will go to the don't do anything, and then go to the kill everything situation um, in, 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 in this precise way. There's only one way of defining this. It's not quite detailed in the, in the width of this, um, this transitional period, but it's, the point is, it's a channel that in this one norm sense doesn't mix it all very much, and then suddenly does something at a very specific time, and it's very clear. And this um, uh, may or may not exist, and the point of the rest of the talk is do this, make it a quantum version, and construct gadgets from it that you can use to solve problems. Um, okay. Good. Let's do it. Um, okay. I should speed up a little bit, but not too much. Okay. Let's assume you want to prepare this guy in, in the ground state. <coughs> you want to do it? You want to prepare it in zero. How do you do it? Well, you apply it here. You apply an amplitude to dumping channel and again, you prepare it to zero. Very, very deep. Of course you can do it. But it will stay zero. It will stay zero, 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 and you cannot stop repairing. But then you cannot do anything because it will just prepare. You want to do, measure something. You want to do do something. You cannot. It will still prepare. You want to prepare and stop preparing. That's the point of the preparation measure. How do we do it? Well, 
think of a um, star graph, think of auxiliary systems, and you apply a Lovillian with Lindblad of this formula, it's like an amplitude damping channel along these guys. And then you couple this Lovillian with Lindblad with the central guy, which only damp this if the guy is excited outside. Right? So condition on this being excited, you damp the guy in, 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 in the middle. And the two degree one should think, yeah, because this stops somehow when all these guys have fired their, their, their potential, that this should kind of stop preparing at log m divided by omega, and it prepares the zero and will stop, um, stop preparing. And this is indeed what's the case. I mean, you have a theorem, I will not uh, uh, go through this. But I will say it in words, it's also more, maybe more interesting. Um, the point here is, you have this device. Now, independent of the initial state, up to an exponentially small fraction of the initial state, it will just run, and with a no, no, known error, this is a one known error, it will prepare the zero, up to a very small error, this will be exponential in m, will do it, and after log m time, will stop preparing the state. This is really, I mean, we have not intervened, we have, there's no control, there's nothing from the outside, we just let it go, it will prepare something to a very precise way that will stop preparing at a given time. Um, but you can also make various error bonds of the, the later times, um, these are all exponentially um, suppressed uh, errors. So, what this does is, it gives us a preparation gadget. It, at a certain time, prepares a zero, and at the time when we want to stop, it will stop preparing this thing. This can be concatenated and used as a flag to trigger other preparations. And it's two local Lovillian. Two local means it will act on two sides at a time, similar as in, in Eugene's um, experiment, and of single guys, which is an amplitude damping channel on the given side. Good. That's the one thing. Next thing. Uh, that's only the two, uh, two, two um, examples I will pick, is timing. One would think, sure, I can do timing, because um, if I want to have n different events happening of getting up, buying milk, having milk in the fridge, better maybe, having breakfast, whatever, sequential things you can think, huh, maybe I have just n different time scales and do things at these different time scales. But that's doomed to failure. If you have exponential tails, then uh, uh, this necessarily means that this convergence time of such a process would be exponential in n. That would be cheating. It might work, but it will work. I mean, it will not work efficiently. It's not a, a, not a part of the which is efficient. So one has to be uh, uh, smarter than that. And that's a way. Yeah. OK, that's a timer. Let's think of a linear chain of n qubits. And they are prepared in 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And you say, what do you mean prepared in? That's totally against the spirit. I'm not preparing anything. And of course, it's not prepared. I use the, I, the preparation gadget. Because initialization is a very difficult word in English. The preparation gadget um, preparing the 0 and the 1. But this will never be switched off. This is just the guy, the guy that runs on forever. We are not switching anything. It's just running. But in this sense, we have this initial state. And then we apply um, a Lovillian, a local Lovillian, that um, condition on this being in zero will add a, do an amplitude damping channel on this one. Yeah? Simple thing. And then, yeah, it's an amplitude damping channel of a ring. Intuitively, it's pretty clear what should happen, right? Because this guy has to be in zero for something to happen. At the very end here, there's, there's ones, nothing will happen. Because it cannot do it. It's, it's, it's one. Here, nothing will happen. It will not happen. Here, it will kind of happen. It will kind of eat in. It's like, a, like ice melting. It will eat in from the left. This is zero. Then it will damp this a little bit. This will be zero-ish. And then this will kind of eat in. It will kind of walk through this thing. Yeah. And that's intuition, but this can be made um, rigorous and not only is it eating in, but in fact, this is what happens. Um, well, I show a picture of what happens. What happens is that this is how it looks like. The last qubit in this chain will not change the state at all for as long as you want. 
and at a linear time in the length, at linear n, it will very suddenly drop and will go down at a specific time up to a very, uh, 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 very small arrow, it will stay like that. This is exactly what we thought of a carpet phenomenon. For large systems, to the left, it will not have done anything. If you go to the right, it will have exactly done what you want. Yeah. And not, not only that, but I mean, I'm not going into detail here maybe. Um, you, it's not only color phenomena, but because you know the, the exact form of the tail, you know exactly what the tail is and how this asymptotically scales in the, in, in the large end limit, which you need in order to make a rigorous error analysis, yeah? which can be done, but I'm not going to, to bore you with that. But I'm rather insisting on the point that you have this um, situation of this chain, you have a local ability, you're not switching anything, and independent of the initial state, it will just not do anything, it just sit there. And then at some point in time that you can define, it will just flip and do something. At the time that you decide, it, at the time, it will do something. And this is a clock. You can do a rigorous error analysis for imperfect preparation, still works very well. It gives a timer gadget, it's a precise clock of doing things, but not a clock that you as an experimentalist got from the outside. You're not intervening, you're not introducing extra noise. It's a clock that the system itself does, not from unitary dynamics, but from using the couple phenomenon and this dissipated dynamics, you're not doing anything at a time, it does something. Okay, and from now on, I will be blah blah, last 10 minutes. This is a toolbox that gives rise to ideas of timed dissipation driven quantum information processing in the sense that we saw in Marcus. Uh, like open system dynamics, but here you can think of this being timed in a certain time fashion. So you can concatenate these things and think of, use these tools as triggers to do something. For example, prepare states. You can prepare graph states. Right? We know what graph states are, they are a certain instances of stabilizer state, and you can prepare them in a dissipated fashion, but not only that, you can prepare them in logarithmic time, and you can stop preparing by using the trigger, the initialization device, and that you couple with the cooling to the Hamiltonian. Um, the, the, the graphs that experts will remember will see this part as the frustration-free Hamiltonian, which of which the graphs is the ground state. Um, well, it's a cooling process, but you can cool this to the graph state. Well, that's, this is not very deep, but the deep thing is you can stop preparing. It will be there and will stay there. You can also prepare a cluster state, well, of course, it's a graph state. So that's the graph state where you have these sites and then you have a, a, a phase gate with the nearest neighbor. It will prepare the cluster state in logarithmic time in the number of sites and will stop preparing. So you have this guy and you can do something with it. And then we said, oh, that's good. Now let's, let's play with it. And then we came a little bit um, into this uh, a playing mode and wanted to push it to the extreme. And one of the extreme play versions of this are, or maybe I have another slide, is um, to do even measurements. Because you don't want to do measurements in the lab by intervening, because again, that would lose the protection of, of, of the gap. But you can emulate them again with new variants of conditioning outcomes of measurements and put them to a scylla that keeps the, the record of the, of the outcome of the, of, the, of the measurement. So this is like a dissipative Liouvillian type measurement, of course it's not collapsed at the wave function, so to say, because it's only Liouvillian, but well, it's just the, it has the same action on this being measured <coughs> and the record being stored here, which on top of that can also be processed, um, processed further. And the extreme, most extreme form of this uh, idea that we um, had in mind was this one, of measurement-based quantum computing without measurements, where you have a collection of systems, you never measure, you never do anything. In fact, there's no control of the system whatsoever. It's just a system. And you identify some parts of it as quantum wires. They are classical wires where you, um, this is a picture that's very much in your spirit, right? It's, it's beautiful. <laughs> and where you have like classical wires where you transport information along this, this, this wire. You get uh, 
measurement outcomes from these Liouville type measurements, you feed them into the glass of the wires, you transport them, and so on. You have this kind of sequential ticking of things in one way or the other, but you never measure. You don't do things, you don't prepare, you don't do anything. It's just a system that evolves by itself, and one can do an error analysis, and the whole thing has a constant gap. So it's a constant gap system, it's just an open quantum system that's going along with Markovian dynamics. It's not more than that, but behind the scenes somehow, in hidden, it's doing as if the same thing as if it did measurements and did a full computation. That's a fun way of thinking of a computation because it's all protected by the gap. Uh, you don't do measurements, you don't have to intervene. It's just an open system evolving. And in the, in the last bit you need to read out, obviously. At some point, you go into the, into the lab and read out one qubit, and that's your outcome. Um, okay, that's, that's, a, that's a bit of a mind game, but maybe more practically, and this is maybe really a, a, a thing that um, one should keep in mind, is that indeed, using these tools that I've only sketched, um, one can emulate any sequence of doing measurements to the system. You don't measure. It's all open system dynamics. But you can do the same thing as if you had measured. You can do the same thing as if you had done classical process processing. Of course you don't. But you do the same as if you had done classical process processing in a dissipated fashion. You can do conditioned dynamics. You measure something, you get an outcome, and you condition stuff on what you uh, uh, have gotten in the, in, the exp in, the, in the measurement and you could condition on that. Of course, again, you don't have to do it, but the statistics is as if you had done this um, measurement. You can do it with a cooling. You have a frustration free Hamiltonian, you can cool to the ground state, and you can show that in logarithmic time you can go to the ground state of this frustration free Hamiltonian so the terms commute. For example, that applies to graph state preparation and so on, but there's a body of stuff that you can do of this type. And you can do gates. If you have a clock, you can just say, I do this gate, I do that gate, I do that gate. Of course, it's included in the set. This can all be done, but you don't do it, but you do it in a dissipated fashion, where the system just evolves, open system dynamics, um, with error bounds and random estimates. You don't do it, you just let it go, and by itself, it will do it behind the scenes, and will just emulate that process without control from the outside, without intervention, protected by a gap, by the field do this thing. And my last slide um, is this one, indeed. Dissipated error correction and passively protected quantum memories. That was an open question for a while. And it seems, well, the question, can you do passively protected quantum memories in one way or the other? And the answer seems yes. Because once we formulate all this formalism, you can just translate like active topological error correction memories where you say uh, locally cool to the uh, ground state of a toric code state, but this is an active control uh, procedure. You could translate using our formalism to a, a passive one where it's just emulating that behind the scenes, but now it's protected by the Leveillian gap of the dynamics. So in, in the classical part of the process can be uh, uh, protected by by, by Tum's rule. Uh, so by, uh, classical etc. automata. So in a way, um, that might not be, I mean, there's a long way to go, but it shows as a proof of principle that one can do passive topologically protected quantum memories. It shows that this is possible. One can find these first efficient models of static topological error corrections if you are um, that, that what I mentioned. And you don't have to measure, or in fact you can't measure, you don't have to do things, you just let it go, and again, behind the scenes, it will just do as if you had projected into these uh, ground spaces. And in this way, for arbitrarily long, you can do a, a topologically protected quantum memory, but not with active control, but a completely passive device that's undergoing a forward time evolution that stores the stuff in, in, a, in, a, in a passive in a passive direction. And um, I promise not to overrun. So with this, I come to my... Uh, Oh, I yeah, have this open questions thing. Um, I'm still not going to run. Um, okay, all constructions, what's the, what's the upsides and what's the downsides? Upsides, well, obvious, right? I mean, you don't need control, no intervention, no measurement, no, no nothing. It's just evolving. It's like a box that just does it itself. Very nice. 
The constructions are k-local. In fact, they are three local, which means that the turn act on most three systems at a time, mostly two, sometimes one. Yeah. This is good because if it was like seven local or like ten local, seventeen local, we would say, oh my god. Yeah. Three local is kind of, hmm, well, it's um, beyond what you want to have, but it's not um, unreasonable. So it proves the possibility of such devices, but of course there's a long way to go to reduce this locality region. Um, like similar to the idea of Hamiltonian systems where you have three body interactions and using these perturbative gadgets boil them down to two local interactions such that they become uh, useful in quantum optic optical implementations with just nearest neighbor interactions and on-site interactions that you can actually do in quantum optical systems and that's exactly what um, we are working on at the moment. So proof of principle, you can do all these things with three local Hamiltonians, no control, no error, but in three local. So there's something surely to be done and to make things simpler, but as, as a beyond the proof of principle stage. Okay, summary, we looked at McCoy quantum channels and dissipative quantum information processing. We looked at this funny behavior of the cutoff phenomenon of card shuffling. You shuffle, 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 nothing happens until a certain point where it's suddenly very mixed. This we translate to the quantum setting and show that there's a kind of quantum phenomenon from cut of phenomenon from a in quantum channels where you don't see anything for a long while and then suddenly the channel switches at a certain time and does something else at a predefined time which you can switch and you can do full error control of this type of stuff. We looked at gadgets, tools, Levillian gadgets to construct new schemes. We had a preparation device that prepares things, stops preparing. That has a clock that do -do 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 -do, does things at a certain time, and these things can be used in order to cook up new schemes for dissipated quantum computing, and presumably also for error correction and uh, fault-tolerant dissipated quantum computing. And with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for that very inspiring talk. I'm sure there's one of the other questions. Well, I have the obvious one about the physical implementation of those um, Leah Williams or the time blood. So, mm -hmm. is there any nice examples that or, where you can find those things or how to construct them? Um, as usual, proof of principle, yes, totally scalable. Oh my god. Yeah? Um, for example, in cavity QED, you can have like, two atoms, you have the, the, like, the ordinary cavity QED settings where there's several hundred papers about, with a leakage from the cavity, a leakage out of the cavity, and you have spontaneous emission, they can have the situation that um, the dissipate, the, the levillians that you get are exactly of the type that we need, and by choosing them correctly, you would also get a, an improvement compared to the usual setting from uh, uh, the, the um, g squared over 2 times kappa, from this, this time scale to the square root of this time scale. So um, this you get, um, and there's other classes this time. So that means as proof of principle, surely you can do these things also in relatively natural quantum optical settings. Having said that, uh, you would rather think in these people's terms, and um, for the scalable stuff, there's something to be done. Yeah, I mean, so the first answer, small yes, big difficult, but they're also not so crazy. I mean, they're. Uh, uh, Amplitude damping with uh, with a flag. I mean, it's really not. It's not totally crazy. It's not easy, but it's also not totally off the moon. I would say it's something fair. Questions? So, yeah, I mean, I guess you're leading towards answering this, yes, but I'm just. I think the resource scale in when you want to do something fancy, yes. like uh, you know, uh, error correction, or yes. something we were talking about, basically. Any classical processing that you needed to do yes. into the problem as well. Yes. Is that, I mean, it's, it's beautiful that it's in principle possible, but mm -hmm. is there anything nasty in the, the resource scale or something like that? Um, uh, I think the fair answer is no. Okay. In the sense that um, if you speak of error correction and fault and computing, every answer you will provide will be ridiculous. Because error correction is an idea, it's kind of ridiculous in the sense of the overhead that you need. Having said that, it's just that. It's a linear overhead. It's not even a polynomial or something. You need n systems. It's, it's just a, it's a prefactor. So 
in this sense, it's the same. So, yeah, of course, we looked at that. Um, so, it's as good as it gets, but error correction is hard. As we've seen, I mean, this is a small instance, but um, that's already difficult, but it's that. So, yes, thank you. That's a linear overhead. Such a network now, the three local operations that you would need to have. Is that yeah. how, how, how more does, does one need to, to look at that? Is it, for example, three neighboring, three local operations that you would need to have there, or is, is there a bigger network that you would need to have? No, it's uh, geometrically local. It's geometrically local. Like local, local. Yeah, that's a desirable feature. Otherwise, it's a bit cheating. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, if you are not geometrically local, but in terms of support or three sites or so, then you can do more mm -hmm. sometimes, but yeah, I mean, this is really pushing it. And um, they really need us. Yes. But of course, for fun memory, for example, that would be, need to be probably more or less, more distant or something like that. Than yeah, 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 sure indeed. I mean, you would have, yeah, well, sure. I mean, this is like, um, uh, uh, I mean, of course, anybody who says that you can do fault recording computing, I mean, that's a ridiculous statement, right? Of course, it would be a, a massive overhead. But you would have like, uh, you can embed this into a like, two-dimensional structure and you would have like linear stuff, yes. But it's, all these constructions are geometrically local, meaning that you can make a graph, or some network, some lattice, and then you talk to your neighbors, left, right, up, down, that's what you have. I mean, it's difficult good enough, but that's what you, you need a lot more. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much.